the Socialite series, where we celebrate and promote women who influence the world. We do this each and every week to bring you information, inspiration, and motivation from socialites who have something to say. I'm your host, Monica Karst. Now let's get this party started. Started. Hello, party people. It's that time, the time where we get to celebrate amazing women all on a Tuesday. If you're tuned in, you're listening to the Socialite Series. If it's your first time, welcome. And if you're coming back, thank you for joining us. I'm Monica Karst, your host, coming to you live from Santa Cruz, California, today with episode number 14, A Curated Feast with Liz Beerball. But before I introduce Liz, I want to remind you, you can always join in the conversation by dialing 248-629-0921. Again, that's 248-629-0921. This is live radio and you never know what you're going to get. And I want to thank our sponsors. A special thank you to Santa Cruz Skin Solutions and Integrated Wellness. Jenna Lee and her team treat their clients with holistic clinical approach to healthy skin and a healthy body. So be sure to visit them at SantaCruzSkinSolutions.com. All right, let's bring out today's guest host. She's a young woman with an old soul, and you'll find out exactly what I mean. This entrepreneur is the creator of Curated Feast. She started a business with the subject she loves, Food. Liz has this amazing talent to have an elaborate conversation about food, but not about what we eat or how we eat or how to prepare prepare food or what's healthy, but the actual fun facts about the origin of food. Let's bring on the amazing Liz Beerbaum from the Curated Feast, and you will see exactly what I mean. Hello, Liz. Good morning. Welcome. Mm-hmm. Good morning, Monica. Thank you for that awesome introduction. You are like sing-songy and cheery, and it's awesome to be on with you this morning. Oh, fabulous. So let's tell the world who you are, how amazing you are, what you do. Curated Feast, give us a little bit of background. Curated Feast transforms the way you see food and the hidden stories of what we eat each day. How did you come up with this? Yeah, um, so... About six years ago, I taught a class called Botanical Imperialism, um, and that was with one of my mentors. Really, he had thought of the concept for the class that he was teaching at Harvard, and he invited me to teach it at Lake Forest College, which is my alma mater. And um, I really dug into these stories about spices and corn and tea and even opium and looked at the world in a new way. So it was this global perspective on history and botany and really the desire for plants moving um, people all around the world. I, I looked at the age of exploration differently. It was just this real amazing shift for me. And I could not unsee those stories once I had seen them um, In fact, I would tell them at cocktail parties very often, I would say, oh, did you know that tea and opium have this incredibly intertwined history? And um, people really seemed to enjoy the stories when I would tell them. And so for about five years, it simmered and simmered. And it kind of came to a boil when I left the job. I went to Italy and I thought, what the heck am I going to do? And I really combined a bunch of passions to create the curated feast. Which is phenomenal. It's absolutely awesome. And how did you think of creating a business and how did you think it would work? There must've been a lot of negative self-talk. So how did you get through that? Because what it is now is fabulous. And if once people Uh go and visit your website and once we start to talk about it and like really tell people what exactly this thing is, Mm -hmm. how did you deal with the negative self-talk that we all go through when we're opening a business that's unique in the industry? Yeah. You know, I love that question. I, I think I have a lot of practice starting pretty broad sweeping projects. Like I had, um, So I just turned 30 this year. So in my 20s, I had started a farm. Yeah, (laughs) I had started a farm, a gallery, a museum, 
Um, both my parents are artists and also raised me in this environment where basically everything I did was incredible. I am really grateful to them and to my family for just raising me with that confidence. And of course there were questions and, you know, fears that crept up, but overall, I guess I want to start by saying that I had a pretty strong base, which I feel really, really fortunate for. Um, but the negative self-talk did come in and I guess it was more in the vein of whether people would also enjoy the way that it was, it was going like the way that an event goes is basically, and you were at the first one, Monica, um, <laughs> the way it goes is, is, you know, telling a story with each course coming out. Um, and I know for myself, I'm a super nerd and I had this fear that maybe people wouldn't be as nerdy as I was. And um, the first event just totally squished that fear out because everyone really loved it. And all the feedback I got was honestly so positive for a first run of this concept that was just becoming a reality. Well, and it was an experience. It's not nerdy at all. It was absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> and, the, and your delivery is just so amazing. And it just, yes. So let's walk people through what that looks like. Okay. Mm. So cool. we get a ticket to entertain. We go, the ticket includes uh, like what we have, like a five course meal and dessert and drinks. It so, was, yeah, exactly. Five course with dessert. Plus a mousse so, bouche in the beginning and drinks. Yeah. Yeah. So you are the storyteller that pairs mm -hmm. up with a local chef. So Liz comes mm -hmm. with the, she's the entertainment, basically. You are. You're the entertainment paired up with a local chef. And the two of you work really hard together to come mm -hmm. up with a menu and the stories. So we come in and what were the themes? Remind me, there was the grease one. There was the, there, yeah. remind me what the titles were so we could tell everyone. Yeah. Totally. So the first one was A Taste of Ancient Greece. Um, right. And then, and I will say, I guess before I list them off, this also the first three especially go in this arc of history. So we go from Ancient Greece to the Silk Road. And then the third one, the third meal feast was 1493. And that was a feast of origins and looking at old world and new world. Um, so like geographically kind of moving, um, you know, in a, you know, organized way, and then also literally through history and this big arc of history. Um, right. And then the next one was was kind of a almost a recap of those. I um, mean, I did that in San Francisco, and that was called a feast of botanical imperialism. Neat, 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 neat. Yeah. So we show up like let's use the um, Silk Road. Was it the Silk Road? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So That's you the show up. One, yeah. The second one. So you show up and you wear your attire according. You can. You don't have to, but it's fun if you play yes, to the wall. You did, wearing, though. That was great. Yes, of course <laughs> I did. I wore my silk shirt with my chopsticks uh -huh. in my hair. And so you show up and the entire night is based on that theme, that era. We get a little map on our table, which will show us the, the history and the trail of where we're, what we're going through and the food that matches the location we're at with a fun piece of history that Liz will do a story on. And it's fabulous. It's so fabulous. And everyone needs to experience that. So if you are here, if or which actually Liz will be traveling too, right? Liz, you're going to be going all over with this, all over the world with the yeah, curated. That's the plan. So make sure to look up on her website so you know where she's headed. Um, I know she has one coming up soon, and we'll talk about the, that about a little later. And you're going to want to make sure to um, get on that ASAP because it sells out. So let's give everyone an idea of exactly how this works. I have a few words that I'm going to throw out at you. And we're going to see what stories you come up with. How's that? You want, you want <laughs> to play? Good. Yeah, super fun. Let's play. So we're going to start out with apple pie. What are you going to tell us about apple pie? I love that. So, you know how um, you've probably heard the phrase, there's nothing more American than apple pie. Have you heard that? Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, did you know that none of the ingredients in apple pie are actually native to either of the Americas? Mm, that doesn't make sense, but do tell us why. Right? 
How could there not be anything more American? So actually, apples are from Kazakhstan. Wheat is from the Fertile Crescent. Butter is definitely from the old world, wherever cattle were, or even sheep and goats, all old world um, domesticated animals. And uh, cinnamon is from Ceylon, or which is modern Sri Lanka. And sugar is from New Guinea. And so I always think this is the most hilarious idea that <laughs> apple pie is this American dish, when in fact, in a beautiful way, it comes from everywhere, which I think is kind of poetic to the, the broader point of being a melting pot. Interesting. So maybe we have to reconsider, yeah, exactly what apple pie means. Mm-hmm. And that we are all part of one big world. Hmm, I like that. Yeah. Very mm-hmm. interesting. So let's go on. How about feta? Tell us about feta. Ooh. What do you know about feta? I, love I know that you one. like so this actually, one. I know you like the, this one. Because <laughs> it was the very first course and the very first feast I did. So so it was paired with um, a barley berry salad. So barley berries were representing um, ancient Greek trade routes. And then the the herbs in the salad represented medicine, but the feta cheese to me is still maybe my favorite story to tell. You've probably heard me tell it 10 times, Monica. Um, But it's it's really about the Cyclops, because if you go back into the Odyssey, you see that Odysseus and his men come across the Cyclops cheese cave, and then they go back into the hills to wait. And when they attack him, he is coming back in with his flocks of sheep and goats. So the poor guy is just an artisanal cheese maker and he gets this really bad monster kind of reputation because of the way the mythology goes. Oh, very fabulous. And that's feta. Mm-hmm, oh. That's feta. Yeah. Okay, moving right along. Vanilla. We all love vanilla. Ooh, vanilla. Yeah. Well, so vanilla is a kind of a complicated story because, first of all, you know, people say, "Oh, that's so vanilla," right? Do you ever say that to say that something <laughs> so is vanilla? Bland? Which it's yeah. so not bland, um, but you'll tell us exactly it's why. So that's not bland. Sure. <laughs> um, well, it's. I think first, my first favorite fact is that vanilla it comes from an orchid, um, and maybe folks know that. But I think even more interesting is that it comes from an orchid native to Mexico that historically and, you know, in the wild is only pollinated by one species of bee. So how the heck do you get vanilla everywhere in the world if it is so localized in its um, adaptation? Um, So the interesting part, now this is, we're going to go on a little historical journey here per usual. So it wasn't until the, (laughs) awesome, (laughs) it wasn't until the 1800s that the vanilla orchid was brought out to this one French colony called Reunion. And basically, it's right next to Madagascar. At one point, it was called Bourbon, which kind of gives you a hint about bourbon vanilla. Mm -hmm. And um, Reunion was where this... um, uh, so, So first, I guess I'll say, all over the world, botanists were trying to cultivate vanilla, but they were not able to figure out how to pollinate it. And of course, pollinating the vanilla orchid meant getting the vanilla pod, which is, which is what you're after. So in 1841, one 12 year old slave boy named Edmund Albius on the Island of Reunion figured out how to pollinate vanilla. And it's literally from that time and because of him that vanilla is such a commonplace flavoring today. There's no way it would have been ever, ever so big. Um, It would have been this. I mean, we would have had the flavor and perhaps, you know, they could have synthesized it in a lab, but it is all down to that one guy. So his Wikipedia page exists. It's really, I mean, (laughs) there's so many crazy little things. Isn't that fascinating? Oh, my goodness. No, no. Don't don't be saying plain like vanilla because vanilla is not bland. That's right. Ooh, okay. So let's go with one more. How about potatoes? Potatoes. Potatoes. Yeah. So those are actually, I just finished a book and um, I was working on it with a group of friends and we called ourselves the Santa Cruz Heritage Food Project. 
and we are working on publishing that book. In fact, the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History, the MA, is going to publish it. This is brand new news as of the last couple of weeks that they are officially in. And um, Tell us the name of that again. What is it? Well, so the book, we're trying to figure out the title still, but the project is called the Santa Cruz Heritage Food Project. And what we have done is look at local history. Um, and I guess I'll step back a second to say that the stories I just told were quite global in nature. And that's really um, an area that I love to learn about. I love the sweeping global history, but I also love the local. I've lived in Santa Cruz for almost five years and I really just gain so much when I can learn about the deeper history of a place. Mm. So potatoes figure in our history. Did you know this, Monica? I had no idea. I can't wait to hear how potatoes are tied to Santa Cruz. No. And I was born and raised here. Born and raised in Santa Cruz. Do tell me. (laughs) So do tell me. Potatoes are the crop we have to thank for downtown Santa Cruz being where it is. I swear you'll never look at downtown the same way. So in the early 1850s, there was the gold rush in California territory in general. And there was also sort of a subsequent or parallel boom that was happening to feed all of these miners, this sudden influx of a population. There was a lot of market opportunity um, in agriculture. So Santa Cruz put itself on the map. In fact, even later on getting an award at the New York um, World's Fair saying it was, we were growing the finest, finest potatoes ever known. And um, we were feeding the miners to such an extent that all this land where downtown is today, which is really the alluvial floodplain of the San Lorenzo River, all that land was covered in potato farms from about 1852 to 54. Wow. And and it brought in all of these speculative, like entrepreneurial farmers trying to really make the yield. It was really this incredible amount of money at the time that you could make from potatoes. So, so many people planted them and then they had to, almost instantly developed this infrastructure to deal with getting them up to San Francisco. So one, my other like kind of side favorite visual fact about potatoes is that from the top of West Cliff at Bay and High, if people are familiar, it's kind of where the Dream Inn is. And sure. there was a chute that they built that went out all the way past the surf to get the potatoes to the boats to get them to San Francisco without flashing them. So just like never going to look at Santa Cruz the same way again after I have, you know, done this research on potatoes. It really is hilarious. And again, again, kind of one of those very humble crops that really has these stunning stories behind it. That's fascinating. And to know that I've lived here my entire life and had no idea about the history of potatoes. Wow. Very cool. (laughs) When I eat my french fries today, I'll think about that. Yeah, good. (laughs) I'm also glad you're eating french fries. Those are really healthy for you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So there you go, folks. This is what Liz does. This is what the curated feast is. You are fascinating. You know that I'm your biggest fan. I just love to throw words out at you. And to see your old soul come in and just take over the room with radiant stories. And you're so knowledgeable at this because it's your passion and you love to do this. Let's talk about what's coming up next. I know you always have something planned. What do you have coming up next that people can join and come see you at? Yeah. So my next feast is in October. Um, Until then, folks can definitely follow me on Instagram. I do maybe about two to three stories a week, which is great. Um, But the feasts themselves are really, if you are able to come to Santa Cruz or if you live here, um, they're really spectacular, like opulent evenings. Um, And like Monica said, they're about four to five courses usually. Um, And basically the next one, I'm kind of going into a new territory, which, um, 
is into archetypes. And so I'm looking at almost what is a mythology of food. So, for example, this piece is going to look at the four archetypes, which originally were the four archetypes of masculinity, which, of course, Monica, you know I had to make it also <laughs> of femininity. Oh, um, yes. So, um, yeah, so it's going to be the king and queen, the warrior, the magician, and the lover. And so each of those archetypes is going to inform a course. And, of course, it's me, so we're doing history along with each of those archetypes. Ooh, so fun. Do you have a location already? Yeah, um, it's going to be at a private residence in Santa Cruz. I'm only going to release the location to folks who buy tickets. Absolutely. Um, Mm-hmm. But near downtown, I will say, actually, on a street, if you if people really want to get into it, it's on a street which actually relates to potatoes, but that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere where they grew potatoes. And if you are from Santa Cruz, you will know where what that general area is. Totally. So, <laughs> and do we know the chef who's going to be yeah, doing I, the food with you? I don't Have I told you this? It's so exciting. I am working with Chef Hetty. Of Plate and Bottle Supper Club, who, oh. um, Monica, you introduced me to when we did our event at Pure Pleasure, Sexy yeah. Self Love. And Fantastic. that was kind of, yes, she's so wonderful. So that was kind of a three course, not a full feast, of course, which is why we haven't really talked about it yet. But I was so impressed with all of the things Hetty produced for that night. Her food is just spectacular. And she really gets it. Like she and I collaborated and added all these amazing elements together. And I also, when I've worked with other chefs, that definitely happened, but um, I had only worked with Hetty this one time, that one time with you. And I just had to work with her again. Oh, absolutely. She makes such beautiful food. She gets it. She gets the stories. She gets um, the presentation Mm -hmm. and the feel and the vibe. And she's absolutely amazing. She is just like, yeah, yeah, another awesome woman in Santa Cruz. So Hetty from um, Plate and Bottle, if you guys look that up. I don't believe she has a website, but she does have a Facebook page. Yeah. And I will say, if I can just add a little more about that dinner, do we have a minute to do it? Yes, you do. It's your time. Let's hear it. Cool. Thank you. So um, just back to those courses and what Hetty and I are cooking up right now is also something that's a bit more performative than previous feasts have been, if folks have been to them that are on the call. Um, And really, you're learning about the archetype and the history, like I've said, but you're also going to be engaged in the meal in a new way. So, for example, the, or actually, Monica, why don't you pick a course and I'll give you a little example. So do you want to do king, queen, warrior, lover, or magician? Oh, of course I'm going to pick the lover. I knew it. Okay, good. (laughs) Great. Um, Or actually any of that would be good. But so just a taste of what the lover will be. Um, Basically, the intent is that everyone will get a paintbrush and an empty plate to begin. And it will be dipped in something that will allow you to paint on your plate to create the base for the course. So for that lover course, you are engaged in a very sensual way to create this base and this artistic space for your own lover to emerge. And Mm. then it's also going to be paired with most likely going to be paired with ancient Persian stories and, um, you know, Arabian nights or like a thousand and one nights. Do you know Mm. that? Like the Aladdin, you know, Sinbad, the sailor and all that. So super familiar stories, but I was even surprised to learn that the storyteller there was a woman. So her name was Scheherazade, and it's actually there's a there's a beautiful um, there's a beautiful piece by Rimsky Korsakov, um, an orchestral piece that um, my brother had played in, and like I went to go see him play it. He's my little brother, and I, it was one of my favorite things I had ever seen performed by an orchestra. And I put it all together and was one of this sort of one of these synchronistic moments that oh. So A Thousand and One Nights is about Scheherazade, and she is this really amazingly powerful woman storyteller, and so she is going to be the feature in the lover course as well. 
Oh, I'm so excited. So there you go, everyone. Where do we get the tickets? So you can get tickets at thecuratedfeast.com. Um, it's also on Eventbrite if you look for a feast of archetypes. Um, there's also feast a link to my Instagram. And, um, What's and your I'm Instagram be handle? Oh, it's what the is it? curated feast. The curated <laughs> feast. Okay. And we will put yeah. all of this on the Santa Cruz Socialites Facebook page. So you'll have all the links to Liz and the curated feast so that you can join in. But wait to buy your ticket until after I get mine because I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I cannot wait save to have you seat. there, Monica. Save me a seat. Super exciting. Oh, yeah, Anything else you want to add to this? I mean, you are phenomenal. Your curated feast is fabulous. Um, anything you want to end with? Anything else you want to put a shout out for? Um, Ooh, share with us? Shout out. Yeah. I mean, I guess I just want to say thank you for, you know, the reason I do this is because I'm always hungry for more stories. But the reason I like get up in the morning and feel excited to do it is because of people like you who really give me the confidence by giving me the the space either to talk about it or just the encouragement, which you do so well. And, you know, I would love to have um, each feast so far has been sold out and I would love to have this be a full table of about, you know, 26 people. I keep the events pretty small, but I just love being able to share, the, share these stories with people. And Monica, I'm so thrilled that I can already imagine your face sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You are amazing. And I do adore and appreciate you and your storytelling. So thank you. Thank, thank you for you. being on the show. And Yay. with that, yeah, so that's a wrap for today. I want to thank Liz Beerbaum from The Curated Feast. Make sure to go over and visit her on Facebook, Instagram, and we will post out all of her information and upcoming event on the Santa Cruz Socialites Facebook page. Thank you to Damian, our producer, who always takes such good care of us. And thank you for listening don't be shy and make sure to share, like, and comment on all of our social media platforms. So that's a wrap for today. This is Monica Kars reminding you every day is a day to celebrate. Cheers. Oh, cheers, Monica. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the Socialite series. To find out more, visit us at SantaCruzSocialites.com and MonicaKars.com. Until next week, be seen and be heard and get out and shine your socialite on your community.